the end. Let's put the heart in the center. Let's put the human at the core of everything we do. Uh, that brings me to the next panel, and uh, you will once again uh, uh, get to, to know uh, entrepreneurs and get to know fantastic projects. And uh, we stay in Switzerland this time uh, just to show you that there's so many ideas and so many projects in this country as well uh, that are worth taking a look at. Uh, we're going uh, to change generations almost, uh, especially for me. When I was looking at all these projects and all these people, I was in awe. I was both fascinated and a little bit depressed because when I saw what these people have achieved at their age, and I was thinking at myself at that age, uh, you can only be depressed because I said, oh my God, this is, this is incredible what uh, they have made out of their ideas and out of their uh, companies. Uh, it's, it's quite inspiring as well. So I'll let you uh, get to know uh, these projects, these entrepreneurs and uh, these uh, companies. And uh, we have invited someone uh, to uh, introduce them to you and to uh, speak a little bit about their projects with them. Uh, uh, someone who is, who is very much uh, in that scene as well, who knows the entrepreneurial spirit of Switzerland and who is herself uh, very active in, uh, in, in, in sustaining that kind of ecosystem and also bringing in investment, which is, as we know, also very important. We have Carmen Funkhauser here. She's deputy director of CGBA Invest Western Switzerland and co-president of uh, Nice Future, board member of B-Lab Switzerland. And I leave Carmen the stage to introduce all the uh, fantastic entrepreneurs to you. Carmen, there she is. Welcome. Is the microphone working? Working, ah, yes. Now it is. Guten Morgen, buongiorno, bonjour. I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to ask all the entrepreneurs, the Swiss entrepreneurs, to come up on stage uh, with me. I feel a little bit lonely right now. <laughs> So, um, just to say, I'm a former uh, Deputy Director of Economic Promotion of Western Switzerland. Um, just to make it clear, I'm still very involved uh, in different uh, <laughs> sectors and ecosystems. And I newly joined the board of uh, B-Lab Switzerland. Um, so, this is why uh, today uh, this is a picture from yesterday, from our uh, dinner we had. Um, it's big and small at the same time. Uh, the Motorhorn is very impressive, very good for meditation in the morning and in the evening. Uh, and it, this is the title of our uh, table, round table today, when small inspires big. <laughs> Why? Because we have here uh, small economic actors, but with um, big, strong, high values uh, of uh, impactful environmental and social uh, performance on society. Um, I'm very proud uh, that they now can explain you uh, what kind of projects they have. So, uh, uh, five entrepreneurs, and they all at uh, one moment in their lives, younger or older, uh, decided to go out of their comfort zone. And I think this is uh, very important um, to know because uh, they made some great achievements. And they show us as well um, that we can inspire bigger companies, bigger organizations, because what they did and what they're doing right now is scalable, is financially and economically sustainable. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. <coughs> so I will start with the only <laughs> female entrepreneur uh, with us. <laughs> so nice picture. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I am terribly uh, happy and inspired by what I heard yesterday, by what I heard this morning. I have to tell you, it's very encouraging for people like us uh, to meet Gunter Prauli, <laughs> but also to hear all the stories we've heard. Um, it fuels our energy, our vision to pursue what we're doing. Um, so my name is Sophia. Um, I started my career as a lawyer working for multinational companies in London in the field of uh, mergers and acquisitions. 
And the reason why I tell you this is because, um, yes, we go through university and we have parents that want the best for us. Uh, for my father, it was law. Um, and I followed his advice and I went all the way until the sense and the conscience came back to me. Um, and I was 30 years old. Um, and I thought to myself, I've spent seven years working night and day for companies to grow and grow and grow and become more efficient, more competitive. Um, what if I could use those, uh, this experience and those compétences uh, for an um, uh, economic model that made more sense and that could ally financial equilibrium with human values? And so I did 15 years ago. Um, the good news is I'm still here to talk about it, so it is financially viable and I'm still alive. <laughs> um, today I come to speak uh, of Opaline. We spoke of the Opaline Foundation perhaps before. I need to tell you that the foundation today has been possible and it was created last year. It's because we started producing those bottles you see on the, on the picture, um, which are basically local fruit juices and local lemonades. In a world where um, the economy with you know, the size it's taken, we as a team, Opalin is a whole team I represent here today, believed that we were terribly disconnected. Disconnected from who we were, disconnected to the people we were working with, be it our fellow team members, but also our suppliers, and of course, the market, the consumer, the community that makes it possible. Um, so we work locally with local farmers. We buy our fruits within a 35 kilometer radius here in Switzerland, very close to here, by Sion. You've probably passed it when you came. Uh, we produce with solar energy. Uh, all our juices are produced with the solar energy, the line, the press, and the bottling. Um, and we have a biogas um, company just next to us, so all the pulp from our juices uh, actually make biogas. Um, in terms of numbers, we reached, and we're very, very happy last year, we reached a million bottles produced and sold on the Swiss market. Um, for some of you, it may seem small, but for us, when we consider that buying a bottle of juice today is actually saying yes to this economic model, it's a vote, it's our community supporting our vision. Um, well, I always say to politicians, you know, if you think our company is small, how many votes do you have? Because we have a million, and we have it every year. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to that, million bottle reached with a financial equilibrium, we decided to um, uh, create the Opaline Foundation, and the Opaline Foundation goes one step further, and we work with farmers, because in Switzerland the farmland <coughs> exists, it is there. But farmers are terribly disconnected from their community. So we go and meet them, and we propose with our community, anyone who wishes to actually fund our initiative, to fund a fruit tree, because the tree is symbolically very important in our ecological transition, we all know why. So we fund fruit trees, that the farmer can plant, or if he's already got them, he can actually keep on uh, looking after those trees. But beyond that, we've created um, a place of life. So we work with a biologist person and also a soil person to make sure that everything is organic and the birds can come back with the choice of the right flowers um, and the right aménagement on the uh, fruit farm. And as I talked about this connection, we, we also create um, a program of uh, mini conferences, ateliers for local schools, for local communities, be it uh, entrepreneurs, local politicians, to come on the farmland and actually hear about uh, ecology, hear about how do we pick up an apple, you know, what does it mean, and of course connect with the farmers. <coughs> this is what we've done with the Opaline Foundation. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. So Briac created, uh, co-created uh, Highlight. Uh, Highlight is a startup, and when we talked together, uh, he said that everything is possible. So <laughs> we're happy to hear about this. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for welcoming me here. Really happy to be here with uh, all these inspiring people. And so we, uh, I, I'm studied here in Switzerland at BFL, and at the end of my studies, I started working a little bit as an engineer. Then I thought I needed to have more meaning in my life. And I went, went to Tanzania to look for what are the needs. How can I help them by creating a company? And so I learned that more than a billion people live out of the grid. 
And these people spend up to 30% of their incomes for light and phone charging. To get lights, they usually burn kerosene, which is not only expensive, but very toxic. It's as toxic as smoking two packets of cigarettes per day. Uh, and phone charging is also really important because uh, almost 90% of people own a phone, but only 30% of them can charge it at home. That means that more than half of the population in Tanzania owns a phone but cannot charge it, and they need to go to kiosks. Sometimes they have to walk for hours to go to a kiosk and pay a very high fee for this. So with my co-founders, we decided to, to create a company that would solve these two problems, so the light and the phone charging. And for this, uh, we developed a consumable-based iron battery. So it's a very simple device, and every time the people need electricity, they insert iron. And what's really good with iron is that it is the most abundant electrochemical on Earth. So that's something that's completely clean, and, and that's really cheap also. I'm going to see me both. <laughs> and, and so now we, um, we have a um, company in Tanzania, and we, we're producing the first batteries in Tanzania, and we'll start pilot sales uh, <coughs> next month, actually. So it's an exciting time now. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really good with, with this product is it brings, both at the same time, clean, s safe, affordable, and on-demand electricity in rural Africa. Uh, the on-demand part is really important because there's more and more solar lamps that uh, are coming to the market. But the, the really cheap solar lamps, they don't work on cloudy days. So people can afford them, but then they have lights once or twice a week, and that's not enough. They still need something else. That's why they still burn kerosene also. We also really focus uh, on, on developing the country, and that's why we have the, the offices in Tanzania. We work, uh, with, we train the people, now we're still at the time of training people so that they know how to produce themselves, really want to produce directly, locally. <coughs> and, and we also work with NGOs to train people in rural villages, not only about the technology, but also about general entrepreneurship, so that they can retail uh, our devices, but also grow their own business uh, and become more independent. So uh, yeah, now uh, I'm, I will be here the whole weekend, and we'll be, be happy to, to meet all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now um, Christoph from uh, Choba Choba uh, is presenting uh, his company. Well, to start with, I I have an extremely complicated question for you. Um, who of you guys like chocolate? <laughs> yes, I guess you belong to the 93% of people living in Switzerland or being in Switzerland that love chocolate. And I think one day the other 7% we will convince them as well to love, to love chocolate. But if we talk about chocolate, then we should also think about how it is produced. And the main raw material for producing chocolate is cocoa. And cocoa is produced by six million small-scale farmers in the tropical belt, like here uh, Osvaldo del Castillo in the Peruvian Amazon. And out of the six million farmers that produce all the cocoa, the vast majority of them live below a dollar a day. And the result of that is that we have more than 2.2 million children working on cocoa farms. I myself experienced in Western Africa that a child was sold for 25 years to work as a child slave on a cocoa farm in the Ivory Coast. So that's the reality, uh, the sad reality behind the chocolate. <coughs> and what I can tell you about that uh, is that myself and Eric, that's the other co-founder of Chova Chova, we both used to work in the chocolate industry. I myself was sitting on the uh, management board or the executive board of one of the largest Swiss chocolate manufacturers for eight years. And my job was it to purchase cocoa beans uh, and to implement sustainability programs in the, in the supply chain. So basically I was traveling around the globe and sitting on farms, uh, buying, purchasing cocoa beans from the small scale farmers. And um, one day, I was traveling with Eric again to Peru to purchase the cocoa beans from a couple of communities in the Peruvian Amazon. And during the eight years we purchased the cocoa, we became a bit friends with them. And one day, Osvaldo, again Osvaldo, with his son 
Osvaldo. <laughs> um, they took us apart and they said, hey, Christoph and Eric, it's been eight years we've been selling you our cocoa. You told us to become fair trade certified, we did that. You told us to become organic certified, we did that. We did a lot of sustainability programs. But to be really, really frank and honest with you, look at our houses. We still can't pay the university fees of our, of our kids. We don't have electricity, we don't have running water. Honestly, we, and at the same time, you're selling chocolates with a nice fair trade label on it, uh, with our faces and stories on it. Honestly, we, we don't want to sell you our cocoa anymore. And Eric and myself, we returned, and in the flight, we decided to quit our jobs. And we returned to Peru, and we asked Osvaldo and his friends, so what do we need to do? And they said, look, as long as we just sell our cocoa beans, and even if you get a little fair trade premium or something, we will never escape poverty. We need to radically change how we work in the supply chain. All right, so a few months later, we started a super successful crowdfunding campaign with a business model, um, and we launched the first Swiss chocolate brand that is co-owned by farmers. So Osvaldo and 40 other families in the Peruvian Amazon, they own today 22% of the capital of our company, of our chocolate brand. They have a seat in the board, and what changes is that they now have a voice. They now have a voice, and they, can, they are an actor in the supply chain, and they're not at the end of the supply chain. And thanks to that mechanism, we have already increased the salaries of farming families by 50% within three years. So, we, only, we have a social part, but we also have a quality part. We produce our cocoa beans, fine flavor cocoa beans in the Peruvian Amazon, and we bring them to the best Swiss chocolate maker, and then we have Grand Cru chocolate, so very high-end premium chocolates that we distribute at the moment in the Swiss market. And I'm very happy, I have a little stand over there. If you want to taste the concrete <laughs> chocolates, I'm happy to serve you uh, throughout today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have to say that I, uh, I ate some chocolate this morning. It's very nice. <laughs> Patrick Me. Schwartz, hello. Uh, so Patrick is uh, working in the energy sector, we go from food to energy uh, and he's very aligned with his values uh, because yesterday he, he came from Geneva by bike, took him a little bit more than seven hours. Thank, thank you, you Carmen and thank you to all for the invitation. I'm not very used to speak in a panel of such diversified persons, I'm more focused on energy so I'm always meeting people from energy, and I'm very glad uh, to exchange also after the meeting maybe on energy. Uh, to start the story, I'll be short, as short as possible. <laughs> I'm coming from the Jura, the Swiss Jura, and we are the one who fought to get a new canton. And <laughs> I failed because uh, I'm still in the canton of Bern. So, but I kept the fighting spirit now for energy, for renewable energy. And I think it's much more important for that purpose than maybe to get a new canton. So <laughs> here we go. And uh, you know, the Jura, it's watch industry. I started my career in watch industry and then in a big uh, corporation, American corporation in Geneva. And uh, we were the most uh, effective factory in the group in terms of revenue. And uh, the big uh, guys decided to relocate the, the production. We were employing 130 men and women for the production. They decided to relocate the company in Italy and Czech, Czech Republic just to get 2% more profit. <laughs> and uh, from that on, I was really disappointed. And I stopped making a PowerPoint presentation and Excel sheets all day long and I decided to join a company in the recycling business, and they just decided to start with renewable energy. So I started with a bicycle, the same one uh, we, I have today, and, uh, and a truck. I'm also driving trucks, my father was in the truck industry. So in the morning with the truck, in the afternoon with the, with the bicycle, and sell uh, the products. And uh, it's really, I think, to show our customers also that really involved and we're not just talking but we're also doing 
And that's what uh, we are really doing today. So it's a family business. Uh, we are not linked to the market, to the stock market. It's a long vision uh, strategy. And, uh, and that's it. So nothing else to, to say maybe at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll hear some more. So now, uh, Christoph, Christoph Baumann. Thank you for inviting me. So it's so cool to be here and to speak after those like inspiring people. Um, when people ask me, uh, why do you want to get your people involved? Why do you want uh, not to be the chief of your company anymore? I, I always say it comes from my, I'm kind of an NGO bulimic. <laughs> So I'm, I'm in uh, 10 different NGOs, committees. I started with my ski club, so my, I'm a ski fan. So here, like, it's like my temple, Zamat, because like, it's one of the best ski areas in the world, like you know. And uh, what, I'm also president of the Geneva Ski Association and the Romandie Ski Association and Lottery Romande for Sports and Fédération Romande des Consommateurs and so on and so on. And what I learned in that NGOs is that if you want to involve people, do it with your heart, with sense, and with values. And, and then when you have all that people working in the same direction without, without having someone telling you have to go there, but they go there and in the NGOs, in my NGOs, they, they're not paid for it. Imagine if you can use that model in corporations. It's so powerful. Uh, and that's what we, we try to do at Loico, up like the, the slide, I'll be, okay, we, we don't see anything, it's, it's not a problem. So Loico, uh, we founded it like six years ago uh, with a bunch of friends. Uh, I was before CEO of an insurance brokerage firm uh, that has been taken over six, six, uh, seven years ago now by a big friend group, very focused on the margin, very focused on, on short-term results. And so with our friends, we said, no, we don't want to work with that, that guys anymore. <laughs> and so we left and we founded Loico. Loico is a loyalty company. So it's a loyalty uh, of a group of people, but also loyalty towards environment and society. And when we founded Loico, uh, well, what we do, like in, in, in three words, we do uh, what we call, we are a one-stop shop for support functions. So we outsource HR, uh, <coughs> finance, insurance, so very cool things. <laughs> and, but we do it in another way. And that other way is that we decided to uh, review how we see business, in fact. So when you found a company, a very important thing to, to say or to, or to think about is that is what do you want to achieve together? You want to achieve like the best profit, the best turnover, you want to hire like 1,000 people. And that's a very important question that in, in many companies, nobody can answer. And, and so when we founded the Loico, we decided to, to make sure that everybody in the company is aligned with what we want to achieve together. And so we decided to use uh, the big corporation model, we will speak about it later, as the only KPI for the company. So when the, uh, the people, because we have no, uh, no hierarchy anymore, but when we present the, the numbers, the KPIs to the board, we only present the, 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 the B Corp um, KPIs. And, okay, it's the only slide that we can see, so that's good, that's the most important one. Uh, <laughs> those are our KPIs. And, so we, we know our turnover of 13 million Swiss francs after five years. We hired uh, almost uh, a bit more than 100 people. So it's going pretty fast for a B2B service company in Switzerland. Uh, but what is very important is that we, we are trying to achieve uh, for every KPI or group of KPI that you, that you see here, the most of them. So for instance, for the governance, uh, we have 30% of the people at Loico who are shareholder. So every employee can be shareholder after three years. Okay? Uh, we have, again, governance part, we have no hierarchy anymore. We are what we call a loicocracy, so it's kind of a holacracy, 
the tailor made. Okay? Uh, on the worker side, uh, everybody is free to work when they want, where they want, and the way they want. So we have, we have not like 100 employees, but we, we have 100 entrepreneurs. And that makes all the difference. Imagine when you found a company, you are an entrepreneur, you work like for, 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 for the sense, for, for, for a goal that you have in mind, for a dream. Uh, imagine that all your company, all the employees, has got the same way of working. Ima imagine how powerful it is. Um, for the community, for instance, and I, and, and I love the presentation we had before, where right? like, uh, every employee can spend one month doing, doing good like, uh, on the work hours. Uh, and we, we do that, but we have no frontier. So if you want to spend one month doing whatever you want to do good, you can do so. We have a good example with a movie. Uh, who in the, in the room here saw the movie Demain? It's a French movie. Okay. So our marketing team, two years ago, uh, decided to, to make a movie uh, about, about the Geneva region, based on Demain. So they made Demain Genève. And Demain Genève, <laughs> in 2018, has been the eighth uh, Swiss movie in the, in the box office. So 16,000 people saw the movie, and the movie was made by the, the local marketing team because they wanted to do so. And nobody told them, you cannot do that on your working hours. Uh, for the environment, I have many, many, many examples, but no time, so that I won't go through. Maybe just for the customer side, we are fully transparent with the customers. So we tell everything about our margin. And if we have more than 10% margin with our customers, we give the money back, or we use the money to finance new projects for them. And you know what? Last year, we increased the, the fees for three customers, and for two of them, uh, the customer asked to increase the fees. Because they, they, because they know the margin, they know that we have to make money to, to serve them, and they decided, they told us, could you please increase the, the fees that we are paying for you? <laughs> it's a dream, isn't it? That's it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can leave it like this. It's very good. Well, this is the reason why I joined the board of uh, B-Lab Switzerland. Um, because B-Lab is inspiring and enables uh, organizations and companies um, to use business as a force for good. Um, and this is something uh, I'm, very, I'm really um, very happy and honored um, to support this movement. Um, and you saw right now we have some B Corp examples. Uh, maybe I, I would like to ask you and also those who are thinking of uh, why did you want to join the B Corp uh, community movement. Uh, maybe uh, Sofia on your bottles. Uh, we see it on every bottle. There is the B Corp uh, logo. <coughs> Can you explain us what motivated you? She was actually the second uh, company in Switzerland being certified B Corp. Um, <coughs> I think, as uh, Christoph said, for us it was a very good benchmark. Um, you can have values, you can have passion and engagement, um, and you think you're doing good, um, and you hope you're doing good. What Pico has brought us is actually proof um, that we were doing good. Um, it's a very long process. Uh, it covers, as you can see, all sorts of sectors in your industry, and you can actually see, in terms of scoring, how you are performing. So that's the, that's the first uh, good uh, reason why we joined. And the second one, of course, is you enter into a, a whole community. Um, and as we start talking about common good, I think the word community is very important. Uh, what are others are doing? How can we exchange on ideas um, and help each other, be it in the same industry or in the same country? Um, so that's okay. why we've joined. Thank you. Um, Patrick, maybe you would like to yes. say something? Yeah? Uh, just by saying before we... We do a lot, but we don't communicate. And uh, then we realized maybe we should communicate a little bit more. The competitors are coming fiercer and with very aggressive communication. And uh, the B Corp was the occasion also, the opportunity 
to, to have a statement about our actions and uh, because it really belongs to our DNA, uh, this, uh, all this aspect, this 360 degrees uh, perspective. And uh, we just had to fill up the form, in, in fact, and not change anything in our methods. It was, it was there. But our main issue today is to communicate also that. And uh, B Corp is a perfect example. Well, yeah, B Corp uh, is a tool with a lot of indicators, um, metrics. Uh, it's very complex uh, for many companies. Bigger companies are uh, getting certified as well. It takes a, it's a long process. The interesting um, thing about it is that um, it's about performance. Uh, about the operational <laughs> side and not the processes as other certifications like ISO um, are uh, doing. Maybe, um, Christoph, you want to yeah. add something? F first, like, like Sophia said, for us it was kind of a maturity model to know where we were. Uh, maybe I, I think that I didn't say before, but it was interesting for me because it was kind of uh, striking. So, so we decided not to have salesperson at Loigo. You know, the B2B, B2B business, normally you have a salesperson and they have a network and they call it network to sell the product. And we decided to be different. We decided to communicate a lot, maybe much more than Serbeco does. You're better than us, but we communicate maybe more. Uh, and, but we decided to communicate only on the values that we have. Not about the product, but the values. And the good news is people, like Simon Sinek said, they buy on the why. And, and, and that, that's a good news, because we have a very big uh, growth for a B2B company, and we never, we never presented our product on the market. People are seeing the values, are seeing how we act with the employees, are seeing what we are doing with like, the community, and they want to work with us because they know that with such strong values, our people will be very committed to them also, <laughs> And that was very, for me, it was kind of uh, an incredible thing to, 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 to see because I, I was not expecting that. Mm -hmm. in fact. Thank you. So now, um, as a giveaway, I would like to ask each of you, um, you're part of the real economy, you're active actors. Uh, what is your vision about the future um, when we talk about small in inspires big? How do you see the new economy? going on, what is, what is your vision, um, Christoph? Yeah, I think that in the well, new versus old uh, economy, I, I mainly talk about the chocolate industry. And if you, if you see the chocolate industry today, you have like two players that control 80% of, of all the cocoa that is bought and facing them like six million small-scale farmers. So the price negotiation process is, uh, in, in, happens in a very power imbalance. And the result of that is that the price of cocoa today is half of what it used to be 1952. And if we uh, talk about that, then the big, the very big companies, um, they of course also realize that. Um, and I don't think that the big companies are uh, particularly bad or bad people, uh, uh, let's say. But I also feel like we, we were invited by several of them, of the, of the big companies, to talk to, 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 um, to the owners, um, to inspire them, because they also got inspired. Uh, and also talk, we talked a lot to their employees, and I feel that within the companies, there's already like quite a strong conviction that they need to change. It's just like, but many of them are also frustrated because they're somehow like in a prison of, uh, of a shareholder value thinking. And so they can't really bring the big, the big ship to the left or, or to the right. So at the end of the day, I don't know, I'm not sure whether the big guys or the current economic model is will really, I doubt and I doubt it, that, that they will really shift significantly. I'm not, I'm not sure whether they, they will. I'm, I think it's more probable that young, uh, dynamic, new business models appear uh, and at a certain stage will outdate the, 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 the current economic models that are they're just not um, yeah, they're outdated today. So, uh, it's a bit, a bit mm -hmm. my, my, personal, my personal vision. So 
yeah, I think there is a part of inspiration happening, but at the same time, I also really doubt that, that, that the current economic model really makes the shift to the left or to the right that is necessary. And maybe at a certain date, they will be obsolete. Okay, thank you. Riyad? Yeah, so I, when, I, when I, I hang out with a lot of uh, young people, and I see three different trends that, that are going. There are the people who are looking for money. They really work for the money. <coughs> Uh, they can work really long, long days, but they only enjoy life in the weekends or in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> the, then we have the other people who say money is really bad, and what I want is uh, people and nature. That, that's what's important to life. And there's a lot of people who try to work very little, just what's needed to survive. They, they don't make a lot of profit. And what, they spend all the time in the communities, have very strong community links, and, and stay in the communities, and, and, and a lot in the nature. And, and that's not sustainable because these people working this small, usually they, they use the work of the ones who work a lot. <laughs> and the, the third trend is that the one that I think has to take, uh, take it all is the people who mix business with nature and people. When you make business, you make profit, but you put in the center of your business the, the people uh, and the nature. And the key for this, I think, is, is really important to Make sure that all the stakeholders of your company uh, are happier after having, bus having made business than before. If you know that your customers, you really bring value to the customer, you re really bring value to the, to the to suppliers, your team is, is happy, they have meaning in their life, it's not just because they work not only for profit, I think that's really important. And I think it is our role because we are here because we want to make a change, we know there is a change to make, and we have to lead this change and we have to, to show that it is possible. And I think B Corp is also here for this because if, the, if there's a lot of B Corp uh, certified companies that shows that it is possible, we can put the, the human being, you can put the nature into the business and still make profit. And that will lead the example, the example for the future. Thank you. Patrick, you want to explain us your very <laughs> personal vision about the future? Or maybe <laughs> not the personal. Ah. Maybe the, <laughs> the corporate, <laughs> maybe the global context of uh, renewable energy today. Globally in the world, we are still uh, giving more subsidies uh, to, the, to the fossil fuels than mm -hmm. to the renewable energy. About 100 billions for the renewable energy, about 400 to 500 billions for the, renewable, uh, for the fossil uh, energy. So we're living on a very... Uh, on a bar market which is very distorted, and uh, this is very complicated al also for us when you have to sell renewable energy against uh, fossil fuels. And Donald is just making a tweet and keep the, the oil price low. That's, uh, that's the, the world today of the, the renewable energy. So we have to evolve in that context. And for us, the, the vision is to, really, to act really locally, and we're really doing everything to, uh, to improve the, the energy in our sector. As a reminder, the heat system in Switzerland is about 50% of our con global consumption. It's not electricity. Electricity is 24%. It's good if you do something in electricity, but do something about heating. It's much more effective, and that's exactly the direction we're going to. And that's, we are helping our customer in that direction, making them aware. It's good to change lamps and LED in a school, but what about heating with uh, wood energy, which is local, much more effective. So that's really the, the vision to help our customers and also helping the customers by going to the authorities, for example, to Geneva. We constantly go to the authorities uh, also to convince them about uh, our solutions or global solutions, but it's really something we are fighting and that's my Jura uh, spirit who's fighting against these kind of things. But, uh, yeah. So yep. helping customers to, to have clean heat. Yeah. Great. So just for those who are not from Switzerland, uh, in Switzerland, the public and the private are working very closely together. This is our direct democracy working like that. And it's extremely efficient. Uh, and that's why um, examples like those uh, are very important to inspire um, the government as well. And uh, I'm very positive about uh, the changes coming up. For the future, so on one side, our, I am pretty pe pessimistic <laughs> mm -hmm. because I see, the, I see the glacier, I see how it's going with the nature at the moment, 
Everything is going too, too slowly from my perspective, the politicians, the corporations. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, I see the, the changes on the market. And, and for instance, for us, uh, we had many, we gained many big markets the last three years for big corporations like uh, British American Tobacco for their payroll, for instance, or Japan, <laughs> or Japan Tobacco or, or such companies uh, which have chosen us because of our values. And I see a change. I see a change in, in the way the buyers, the bad buyers, are choosing the partners. And is in, in that side, it's going pretty fast because uh, for five or six years, it was totally impossible for me to imagine that we could gain those markets just based on our values and not on the price. Mm -hmm. So that's cool, but it's, it's so slow that I mm. don't know if we will achieve that together. But I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Sophia, it's because <laughs> I know your vision, that's why I totally forgot. <laughs> and I, and, and your vision, well, your vision is great. Mm. Mm. Um, <clears throat> well, I think it's a vision of hope I'd like to share with you. Um, of course, we're in a state today where things are not going brilliantly. I mean, the Amazon forest is burning, we all know. Um, the other day I heard uh, Cyril Dion, that some of you may know, that compared something I love that I'm going to give you as a vision. Uh, he says social media represents our society because everybody is on social media. He took an example of an Instagram account from Kim Kardashian. I don't know if some of you know her. And he compared it to the Greenpeace Instagram account. And when Kim Kardashian posts a photograph of herself on the beach, she has three million likes. When Greenpeace posts on the Amazon forest burning, they have 50,000 likes. And this is representative of what we are living today. Now, my vision has to be one of hope. I've invested 15 years of my life for social entrepreneurship. Um, and here's my hope. I think behind common good, uh, and to speak of large or small firms, um, there, there is life. There is life. Nature, what is nature? Nature is life. What is human? We're all alive people, we have a heart. Uh, and behind every large multinational, there are human beings. Uh, and recently I've met the head of sustainability at Procter & Gamble. I can tell you, she is an amazing crusader. She's not from Jura, but she is fighting her way to save nature. Um, and she is doing what she can and she's doing really well. Um, so my vision is one of inclusivity. Let's stop complaining and criticizing the big brands or the small brands. Let's be together. Let's share ideas. Um, and let's work really not just for the common good, but for life. Let's work for life. Um, and I have hope because next Tuesday, it's actually my birthday, the 17th of September. <laughs> um, and I've been invited by over 450 students of Sion because they have their climate day. And they had a choice of who they could invite to speak to them all day long. And they invited me. And they invited me to talk about climate. And this is what I'm going to tell them. Climate is about life. It's about love. So maybe you take an EasyJet flight once in a while and you've been criticized by the Swiss media because you went on the street to fight for climate, but you took an EasyJet. But do we really have to be perfect to be entrepreneur for the common good? Well, no, we don't. We just have to be there every day. Every day to contribute to what we can with our competence, with our talent, and with a lot of hope. And my last sentence I'd like you to take away with you, because I love it. So far, what has happened in our world? We have been in love with power. Define power as you like, but we are in love with power. So this is the question, this is the evolution, this is the transition I'd like to share with you. How do we go about transiting from the power of love to the love of power? Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions about uh, social entrepreneurs, about love, about nature? <laughs> I 
Which one? There are two Questlove. Oh. <laughs> Hello, my name is Annika Hartmann. Is your chocolate actually uh, slave-free? Would you say there's no slave labor anymore? Well, um, yeah, of, um, of course. We source our cocoa beans only from the 40 families that is like my second family. So I know uh, every family <laughs> personally, and I know every child, and I know every child that goes to school uh, by name. And um, I go there, well, we have a team of 17 people uh, working for Choba Choba, and we have seven person uh, staff in place. So, uh, yeah, we can ensure that it is uh, child labor free, child slave free. Um, of course, that's just the minimum. We go ways beyond that. Uh, we have uh, set up a, um, with the ETH, ETH in Zurich, we have set up an impact measurement system with around 240 indicators where we measure each family. So, we know a lot of data from each family and also from the from the nature uh, that is around, we know, um, and we measure that systematically. So we want to not only say we have a big impact, and in, in eight years, Oswaldo slaps me again in the face and says, hey, look, uh, um, it's not having a real impact. We want to be there in, in, uh, and say, okay, we have proof. We have scientific proof what has changed. So we really take that um, really serious, and yes, we can ensure it's life free. Uh, where to start? This is really <laughs> difficult because um, uh, to see a lot of experts on the stage and with this lots of doubts, it has to be failure somehow, I think, because doesn't it need a lot of strength of belief that we succeed one on one hand? And the other thing is because you said, and I agree somehow, not to crit uh, criticize the big brands, but on the other side, there are still big brands. They're not interested in any change, and they are following their boss and have no, no, no uh, social responsibility, nothing that, like that. And I discussed it uh, some days ago with a friend of mine. He's working for a big pharmacy company. I don't uh, uh, drop some names. Uh, maybe you know what I'm, knowing, uh, I'm talking about. And he told me for working for this company, almost 10 years, he said, they don't give a shit for, uh, for the employers. The biggest, one of the biggest pharmacy companies in the world. So um, doesn't it need a strong statement and a strong, somehow, I don't know, it's, it, it's not the right expression to a fight, um, to show them exactly you have to change something, really. But, but not just a little bit, but a strong turn to another uh, direction. So. I'm also, as you see, a little bit desperate uh, because uh, if the experts are doubting, so who is believing in, in, in well, the change? I, they, they talk about their personal doubts, but what they're doing, and they're very optimistic. Um, as you know, the strongest uh, impact you can have is the consumer. The consumer is extremely powerful, and this will change. And how will the consumer change its behavior? It's thanks to those entrepreneurs because they are showing it's possible in a different way, right? And they are inspiring as well economic actors, financial actors, political actors, and academia as well, because they're working together, they are partnering um, with them, they are partnering sometimes with uh, competitors as well. And, well, that's my personal vi vision. This is, the, this is the future. This is where we have to go to. But right now, we don't have time to complain and to doubt. We have to act. And this is what they're doing. And I'm very uh, thankful for it. Yes, Chris. Yeah, maybe I can add to that. I, I, I agree um, with you to a big extent, but I, I think I, I doubt that we can bet only on that the consumer behavior We'll, we'll do it. I think we need to put much more the politics and um, the big corporations also into the responsibility in the driver's seat. And so I think from history we have learned that it, it, it's, it's probably not going to happen by itself. I, I'm fully with you, Christoph, to, to say I, I'm, I'm not sure whether we have the pace that we need to make the change happen. And I think we really need to have on a political level some regulations. Mm -hmm. That, 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 that really make um, the big guys that they have to change. Because if not, I really doubt, or I have to doubt that we have the pace to make it, to make it happen. I think it, I'm sorry, I, 
I'd like to say two things. The first one is um, Opalin actually has recruited only people from multinationals, but we haven't recruited them. They came to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So companies like Opalin or other companies here growing gives opportunity for people to go from the big brands to companies with a, a, a better sense of values. Um, and I agree with you on politics, um, and we are actually working hard with the Fédération Romande des Consommateurs to start getting uh, more political help and consumer information. And an example I'm going to give you where you can see the challenge, today you can buy a strawberry yogurt in uh, the large distribution, which we can't, we're not going to name, but under one franc. This yogurt has been produced in five different countries before it arrived in Switzerland and before you can buy it. So environmental externalities, social externalities, I mean, dignity for a farmer, how can we address that if we buy a yogurt for under one franc in large shops? It's impossible. So I think we also need to work on incorporating those externalities because the environment, we're actually buying a yogurt under one franc, but we're <coughs> breathing polluted air from the transport of that same yogurt. Um, but it's by us existing here and talking about it with you and talking about it and proving that we have growth that, as far as we're concerned, big brands like Nestle will start thinking about opening growing and wondering why. Um, and perhaps that's going to start you know, getting them thinking about um, putting the human and ecology into the price of their yogurt. Just, just Time thing. is up, but we, yeah. we started later than we were supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> Good card. Just yeah. a little bit of advertisement to, <laughs> to end that session. Uh, we, we, we're part of the Fédération Romande des Consommateurs. We, we have the mandate of the Swiss Confederation to inform the consumer. Uh, global consumption in Switzerland is two-thirds of the Swiss GDP. If the people start consuming differently, we'll change the, the country and maybe a bit of the world. So be a part of the Fédération Monde Consommateur, be a member <laughs> and be a funder. We need them also. Thank you. There was a question over there. I think that I can speak uh, enough loudly that uh, everybody can hear me, so not a problem. I would just uh, go in line with the uh, uh, lovely lady who, I'm sorry, I didn't... Uh, I, did, I didn't... <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a really amazing and inspiring and fantastic and everything. But just to go in line with all what you had said regarding the yogurt uh, with, uh, for the less than one franc or euro or, or whatever. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was in Geneva in uh, um, uh, September 1999, just in this time. And I was a witness that two trucks full of boletus had been burned anywhere in surrounding because that t those two trucks did not have a proper papers for the harvesting uh, in Bulgaria. It was imported in Bulgaria. Uh, titles had been on the half pages and everything and I was so much happy because I believe that finally somebody will start to take a care about the resources. Twenty years later, in uh, one uh, shop in, uh, <coughs> on the station when I was waiting for the train to come here, I was looking in the fantastic, uh, extraordinary trademark organic boletus came from Bulgaria. And I know that Bulgaria didn't have any single boletus which could be harvesting or on the, with the papers, because it was absolutely dry and ordinary bad season and last and the year before. So it means that those boletos, it is mushroom, came from Bulgaria total legally in this country, but with uh, all artificial or fake papers. So this is the differences between talking about application of the sustainable manners and acting in line with uh, declared sustainable, sustainable papers, which all those companies are alre already have for the years. So on, I am absolutely in line with that, that we should not st uh, complain, but start to work. But simply, I'm coming from the part of Europe where absolutely you cannot act, because you have a wall between acting and something which is declared. Thank you. Mm, thank you.
So uh, I invite you to uh, discuss further uh, outside. Uh, I think it's a break time now, is it correct? Yes. I'll yes. Take over here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Gavin Falkenhout and all the panelists. Thank you.